So we're going through a process of removing who we aren't and putting on who we are. So what we, so for the believer, deliverance is a process of removing who we're not, letting Jesus be king over every area of our life and putting on who we are. And sometimes as we just put on who we are, the, the, all who we aren't slides off. Now, one of the issues that oftentimes that we face as believers is how is it that we find demons with believers? Which I'm gonna address that issue. One of the problems is a misinterpretation of the Greek language that is often translated or You'll, you'll read it as somebody is demon-possessed. The word demon-possessed is an inaccurate translation. It's used two ways in the Greek. First, you have the person who's the subject. The person has, has, and that is the Greek word echo, has a demon, a person has a demon. That word has is the same word, it's, that word echo is the same word that John the Baptist had a camel hair coat. Mary had a baby, she was with child. Uh, uh, a person has a sickness or a person has an offense. The person has the demon and it's the word daemon or daemonion or in other places, an unclean spirit. So a person has that. Not a demon has a person. The camel hair coat did not have John the Baptist. John the Baptist had the camel hair coat. Okay, we got that one? The other thing, the other way it's used is that there is a verb. It is the, it is the verb demoniosomai. And so this actually is better translated demonized, demon-influenced, demon-oppressed, because that word demonizomai, that verb, is a generic term. It's, it, it, it could be the guy at the Gadarenes. It could be that one who totally lost it, who's totally possessed, owned by the enemy. Or it could be talking about just the influence. It could be somebody on the one scale like Peter. In other words, there's a demonic influence there. The Geneva Bible, which is probably one of the earlier English Bibles written in the 1500s, translates the person has a demon correctly. They don't say, you know, they're possessed, but that verb, they translate as demon possession. And oftentimes when one translation happens, people borrow from it as they're making other ones like the King James and, and other ones there. So I'm just trying to tell you that in, in the Greek language, it's, it doesn't say demon possessed. So a Christian, because a Christian is possessed by God and can never be possessed by a demon. So you cannot be owned by a demon. However, you can be influenced, impact, oppressed. They just don't stop their activity just because you gave your life to Jesus. And if you want to know really all about those words and uh, things like that, and you, you'd like to have a resource, I think there is a resource at the table out there that you can probably find that may have that stuff all detailed. I'm pretty sure. But you see, the enemy base, right, resides where they find a place of darkness. So when a person comes into a relationship with Jesus, we become that new creature, that new creation. 
The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely. May your spirit, soul, and body be preserved complete at his coming. So the Bible talks about us being this body, soul, and this spirit. You know, in, in like these three parts, it's kind of like the, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the temple has three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and then the inner, inner court, the holiest of holies. You see that inner, inner, inner part of you is the spirit. You have a spirit born with a spirit. You are a spirit person. You were born this way. When the Bible talks about us being spiritually dead, it didn't mean that you didn't have a spirit. It just simply means that your spirit was cut off from its life source. So it, it, didn't, it didn't, that's why it's spiritually dead because it didn't have, it wasn't connected to its life source. When you receive Jesus, God's spirit comes inside your spirit. You become a new creature, a new creation. That's a very holy place, and I don't think any demon can, can touch at all your spirit because I think that's where the Holy Spirit is, and that's a very holy place. And see, what is happening is that God starts from the inside, and then he's, he's sanctifying everything from the inside out. Everything that you have is all in your soul has already been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus. So what's inside of you is supposed to be emanating to every part of you. You see, your, your soul, your mind, your will, and emotions, you know, he has your mind. In fact, 1 Corinthians 2 says that you have the mind of Christ. You know, your will, I mean, I think it's Philippians 2, 13, it, it is God in you, both the will and the word for his good pleasure. The fruit of the Spirit, with your emotions, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I mean, all of that has already been bought and paid for, and all of that is your rightful inheritance that you should push in to walk, to walk in. Your body? I mean, this body is going to die because of sin, but it's already been bought and paid for because we get a new one. Isn't that good? We get to exchange. This one's because of sin. It, it's going to die, but man, we're going to get a glorified, resurrected body. Now, having said that, I, I do believe that it is our right to push in for divine health. That's what I've been pushing in for this weekend. I've been fighting for it, right? I think it's our right to do that. I mean, you know, sickness was not part of the curse. I mean, it wasn't there. It's not, we don't have to, we don't have to settle for that. And, you know, and, and it's like this, if I could find it in the Bible, then I can believe it. And I found, I found in the Old Testament, this guy named Caleb. He said, I'm 85 and I'm just as strong at 85 as I was when I was 40. Come on, Jesus, the Caleb anointing. I mean, if I can find it, I can push in for it. I was in India one time, and, and you know, we, we, as we're praying, this old guy came in. I mean, he was old. He's everything bent over. I said, how can I pray for you? He said, everything hurts. I'm going, okay, what? All right. Why couldn't you just like give me a headache or something like that? But everything hurts. So when I prayed for him, I, that thought about the Caleb thing, Lord, I just declare the Caleb anointing on this man that he will be as strong at this age as he was when he was young. And you know, God did that for him. The next lady came up, could have been his mother. She asked for the same thing. I prayed the same thing. And God did the same thing. So, not only do I have the testimony of the word, but I have the testimony of what he did for me to step into. You should, what the, I'm just saying. I'm saying we should just, that's what we should be doing there. 
So what is happening is that once we give our heart to Jesus, then we are, we're pushing in to who we are. We're taking off who we're not and putting on who we are. So uh, Ephesians chapter four, you know, 22 through 24 says that we lay aside the old self. We're laying aside who we're not. It's, It's like old clothes, I'm taking it off. Then it says to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and then to put on who we are, the new self, which is in the righteousness and holiness of the truth. So in our new self, we are righteous. In our new self, we are holy. And in our new self, you know, I mean, by the way, that, that, that holiness, that word holiness is not the average word for holy. I mean, the, the, the normal word for holy is the word hagios, set apart. But this particular word for holy, holiness, is it, the word, that particular Greek word means free from contamination. That's because you're intertwined with Jesus who is free from contamination. So we're going through a process of removing who we aren't and putting on who we are. So what we, so for the believer, deliverance is a process of removing who we're not Letting Jesus be king over every area of our life and putting on who we are. And sometimes as we just put on who we are, all who we aren't slides off. So salvation is used in the Greek language in the past, present, and future tense. I was saved, I'm being saved, and I will be saved. The word sanctification is also past, present, and future. You were sanctified when you gave your heart to Jesus. You're in this process of sanctification, setting aside who you're not, and then the day that it will be fully clothed. You say, that's, that's in the Word? Yeah. Well, where is it? Well, I don't have time to go through it, but I do have a source <laughs> if you needed to read about it and uh, look those things up. I'm just saying. Paul talked to the guys at Galatians, and this is what he said in Galatians 4, 19. He, he, he said, I labor until Christ is formed in you. You see, Jesus can be in you, but is he formed in you yet? Ephesians you know, 4 would tell us that we are to come into the fullness of the stature that we find in Jesus. We we already have him in us, but the Jesus within us now needs to be formed in us. So we usually call this process maturity, growing up, taking off who you're not, putting on who you are. The people of Israel go into the land of promise. The land belonged to them. It was their land. They had ownership. It was their possession, but they didn't possess their possession yet. So what they had to do? They had to go possess their possession. They had to go attack strongholds. They had to remove. This is a picture of sanctification. They went in and began to claim what already belonged to them. And God was with them to do that. See, this, this, is, what, this is what we're doing. We're learning to possess our, our possession or what Jesus, his, his possession. When my wife bought our house in California, uh, we bought it in this neighborhood. It's a nice neighborhood. It was on the side of a hill. Uh, you know, we... The garage was underneath the, the house, and then we had this, this, you know, a lot of hill back behind us, and very, very beautiful house. You know, I had a little view we can see and everything. God was just so good to provide us for that. So we bought this house. 
And uh, we move into it. And right behind the garage, under the house, it's kind of a storage area. And so when we moved in, we realized the previous owners left some stuff. I oh, know. So what do you think we did with it? Did we say, oh, well, it's been here for so long. Maybe we should save it for them. No, it went into the dumpster. If they came back five, five or six weeks later, oh, we forgot some stuff. Too bad, so sad. It is gone. That is our house. And so we, we, we possess the whole house. They even left stuff in the attic. We tossed that too. And you see, when Jesus comes into our life, our house is under new ownership. We, t we belong to him. But you know, we might have a closet or two that we're hanging on to. Maybe something that's in the dark. Something you've not let go of. And Jesus wants access to the closet.